Open your Bibles this morning, Romans, Romans chapter 6, and also put something in Colossians chapter 2, and also uh, put something in Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16. My message this morning is not the longest message that I have ever preached. And not every message has to be an intercontinental ballistic missile, you know. They say dynamite comes in small packages. And I think that the content of this message was important enough to not belabor this point with a lot of other subsidiary, you know, comments that could be made. So... Shakespeare said, brevity is the, is the soul of wit. And so it's not that, that brief. I mean, I may end up being an hour anyway. I don't know. But it's not supposed to be an hour. So Romans chapter 6. We're arriving now at a very critical point in Romans chapter 6 because the verse that we arrive at this morning is the very first exhortation that the apostle gives us in the entire book of Romans. It's the first time he actually tells the body of Christ to do something. And here is an exhortation that is directed specifically to those who are justified by grace through faith in the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ and who are in Christ, who have a identity with Christ now who have something that nobody else in the world has. And he has been explaining things to us. And now he's going to make an appeal to the body of Christ based on the information that he has laid out for us until now. So this is a critical, this is in the book of Romans, this verse is the hinge. It's the hinge on the door that takes you from what you were to what you are now becoming and realizing that you are becoming this. You are now entering into a deeper understanding of the Christian walk and of who you are in Christ and how that applies to your life. So this is a a crucial Crucial. I'm sorry that there aren't more people here today. This is a crucial message for the body of Christ. This message. Because it's, it's where you were to where you're going, and it's, this is how you get there. So, we're down to verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is a man on the golf channel and he teaches the golf school academy. And he's a guy from England, or he's English, he may be Scottish, I don't know what he is. But when he hears about someone who's giving instructions on someone, on somebody, how to swing the golf club, and he doesn't agree with what they say, this is what he, he says, let me tell you what I think about that. Rubbish! But he's, he's Scottish. And that's, I think, if Paul was Scottish, he would have said, likewise, reckon, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, this verse is preceded by ten other verses that came before it in this chapter. Last week, I hope you remember, we looked at verses 9 and 10. And if you remember, these verses have to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we said that when we get to these verses, we stop thinking about ourselves. Paul is talking to us about the Lord 
Jesus Christ, we begin focusing on him. When all the vicissitudes of life come, when the storms assail us, when things are not going our way, when the devil lies to you and he tells you that you did something, you thought something, you said something, and now you're no longer in good standing with God, you have to stop thinking about yourself and you think about Jesus Christ and what he did to sin and to death when they came face to face with him. Because what is true about Jesus Christ is also true about you. This is a very, very critical, vital, important point in, the te in what Paul is teaching here. When the devil comes, when doubts come, when fears assail, you say to yourself, I'm joined to Jesus Christ. I am united to Jesus Christ. And what is true of him is true of me. That's the truth of verses 9 and 10. So what is that truth? Briefly, let's, let's look at it. Oh, let me remind you. Verses not, verse 9. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. There are three things in this verse. Number one, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Number two, he dieth no more. And number three, death hath no more dominion over him. Death can never touch him again. Again. Now, since this is true of Jesus Christ, it's also true of you because you are in Jesus Christ. Verse 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. There are also three things in this verse. Number one, he died. Number two, he died once. And number three, He's alive forevermore. He liveth unto God. And like we mentioned last week, it's the eternal God. So it's forever. And the main point of these two verses and why they precede, why they come before verse 11 is because of this. What is true of Jesus Christ is true also of you as members of the body of Christ. And now we arrive at Paul's first exhortation in verse 11. Likewise, reckon. I love that. I love that. Because that is the emphasis of this verse. Without this, it's impossible to enter into the fullness of what God has for us. It's impossible. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. That addresses verse 9. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ. That addresses verse 10. When you look in your Bible, you look at that. This is an elaboration and an amplification upon those verses. The fact that he says likewise in the same manner. Just as Jesus Christ that I just spoke to you about in verses 9 and 10, likewise, reckon ye also. That makes it clear that he is saying that what is true of Jesus Christ is also true of you. You see? You see? So it's very important to understand that this is not something that is experiential in our lives. This is not something that you have experienced or that something that was confirmed by an experience that you had. That's why we are told to reckon it as being true of ourselves in the same way that it is true of Jesus Christ. 
the greatest hindrance that a Christian can have or a Christian will have or a fallen child of Adam will have in reckoning this to himself or reckoning himself indeed to be dead unto sin is because of this reason. It's because he is conscious of sin in himself. Or I should say he's conscious of the ability to sin within himself. He's conscious of the propensity towards, <coughs> leaning towards, wanting to sin. And so how can you say that I'm dead to sin when I'm conscious of the fact that I still do sin? Is a great question. You know, it happened, it, everybody asks it. It's something that we're all going to face. That's why it's important for you to realize that he's not asking you to reckon this to be true to yourself because you have experienced it. He's asking you to reckon this to yourself because this is what he has been teaching you since verse 1 of this chapter. You remember, he started verse 1 with that you're dead to sin. You died to the reign of sin. You've been removed out of the realm and the reign and the dominion of sin, and you were translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son, where now you are under the reign of grace. Grace reigns where you live. Whether you experience it or not, it's true. And... When that happened, when you came from there to here, you didn't feel anything. You didn't experience anything. But here's the fact. It happened. And now that you're in this new domain, you're in this new realm called the reign of grace, the only way that you can enjoy being here, the only way that you can appreciate being here is by acknowledging that something that you did not experience, that something that you did not feel happening to you happened, is by reckoning this to be true of yourself. It may not have happened to your body. We know that. Though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. It happened to the new man. I'm sorry. It happened to the new man that's living on the inside of you, and now Paul wants you to reckon this to be true. So why is it important that you reckon this, that you realize this? That you make a conscious de decision about this to agree with God about what he says has happened to you. Why is that important? Because I submit to you that it's the difference between a successful and happy Christian life as opposed to a miserable, unhappy, guilt-ridden Christian life. Christians can be unhappy. Christians can be guilty. Christians can be brought down when they don't understand the truth about themselves. So I want to take some time today and examine why it's important for you to reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. So I asked you to mark Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, notice verse 2. Because there's something that happens here that is similar to what Paul is asking you to do in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Notice that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the, and the mystery of the Father and the mystery of Christ, which is what he's saying. I know it doesn't say that there. Understand that that's what he's saying. 
And he's asking you to acknowledge. He's asking you to reckon this to yourself. That's what he's asking you to do. Now, if you'll remember, we saw that the mystery of God a couple months ago had to do with the prophets. We read Revelation chapter 10, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So the mystery of God is from Genesis to Revelation minus the dispensation of grace. Everything that God spoke about in time past that is now being fulfilled in Revelation. Revelation 10 says that when the seventh angel sounds, the mystery of God will be finished, which he declared to his servants, the prophets. You remember, we looked at this in detail at how prophecy was spoken since the world began. What Paul speaks was hidden since the world began, was kept secret since the world began. You remember that? Okay. Now, the mystery of the Father in Colossians chapter 2, chapter 2 had to do with the Father making known unto us the mystery of his will. That's found in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Now, the fact that God purposed something in himself means that he, since God is eternal, it is something that he purposed in himself from eternity past. It's something that was always in the mind and the plan and the purpose and the program of God from eternity past. And now, now is made known that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that's at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. When time has been fulfilled, when time is no more, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That's when everything in the universe has been reconciled in Christ. And that's at the end of time. That's the mystery of of the Father. And then this verse, and then the Colossians chapter 2 goes on to talk about the mystery of Christ. And the mystery of Christ is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It's the preaching that Jesus Christ today is the resurrected head of the body of Christ and no longer has a relationship with Israel like he, did, like he did in the days of his flesh. Today, everyone has a relationship with Jesus Christ by grace, through faith, in the finished work of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone on earth can have that relationship. We've been given that ministry. We are ministers we are ambassadors for Christ for God and we've been given the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation to the whole world that's the mystery of Christ as revealed to the apostle Paul these three separate mysteries that we find in Colossians chapter 2 are what give the bible its distinct and unique dispensational character and quality. These three mysteries, the whole Bible is outlined within the time frame and within the context of these three mysteries. You see it. I mean, it's obvious to you, right? Well, the reason that it's obvious to you is because we as dispensational believers have submitted ourselves to the truth of God. We humbled ourselves and we acknowledged that what we thought the word of God taught was wrong. And we took our place as guilty Bible perverting Christians and acknowledged the mystery of the Father, the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. We acknowledged 
the dispensational truth of the Word of God. We acknowledged that rightly dividing the Word of truth was the only way to rightly understand the Word of truth. We acknowledged that in ourselves. And as a result of that, we began to understand the things that Paul speaks unto us are the commandments of the Lord. And the things that he says, when we, uh, when we, uh, what, what, what did he say in 1 Timothy 2, uh, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding. When you consider what Paul says, it's when you acknowledge, it's when you reckon it to be true that you can begin to live in it in your life but you have to acknowledge it first. You see that? There are people out there who will not acknowledge that the Bible is dispensational. They will not humble themselves and reckon this to be true, and as a result of that, they're not walking in the light and the truth of the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. They mix everything together as though everything in the Bible was written to the body of Christ. So they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. And the reason they're not rightly dividing is because they will not acknowledge it. They will not admit it. They will not reckon it to themselves. To be true. I mean, there are some who know this truth and they deny it because it will affect their salary from the church they're in. Like that pastor that I spoke to on the phone from Athens, Alabama, who after listening to time pass, but now ages to come, not once, but twice, twice and saw the truth of the Word of God rightly divided and got in his pulpit on a Wednesday night and said, I've been teaching you wrong. The church did not start in Acts chapter 2. It started in Acts chapter 9 when Saul of Tarsus was saved and became the first member of the dispensation of grace and God gave him Romans to Philemon. This man understood it. He saw it. He admitted it. He acknowledged it. He reckoned it to be true to himself and was ready to begin walking in it until his deacons and his elders came up to him and said, we reject that teaching. And then he cowered in fear at the thought of losing his salary and his tithes. And he rejected the truth. And now, neither him nor his people will have the benefit of ever fully understanding their true position, their true identity, their true unity in Jesus Christ and what he has done for them. They will walk in partial blindness because the man who was supposed to be faithful to the word of God, who was supposed to handle the word of God for them, and who was supposed to lead them faithfully in the truth of the revelation of the word of God according to the dispensation of grace, cowered under the pressure of his elders and deacons. and turned his back on the truth of the word of God that he had proclaimed from his own pulpit to his church on a Wednesday night. And now he preaches with a violated conscience because in his heart he knows the truth. He knows it. You know what money will do to a man. He would rather stand at the judgment seat of Christ and be ashamed rather than be ashamed now and fix it. 
I'd rather be ashamed. I would, I'm glad I was ashamed now and fixed it and said I was wrong. But let's move forward in the truth. See? He did not take a stand. When Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and he talks to them about the wiles of the devil. And he says, having done all to stand. Stand. When they come against you, stand. When they disagree, stand. When they call you a heretic, stand. Stand. Test of character is what it takes to stop you. What does it take to stop you? I'll admit, I, there's a few times I wanted to stop, but it wasn't because I was going to turn my back on right division. It wasn't because of that. It was just plain discouragement of walking alone. So, moving on, okay? I've never watched one of the TV programs that I'm going to talk to you about. But I've seen some commercials. And the name of the TV program, I believe it's called Interventions. No, you've seen intervention. They're intervening in somebody's life where you know there's a family member and they're they've got drug problems they've got alcohol problems they've got pro, you know you know heroin and and f speed and crystal methadrine and you know ecstasy and all the drugs that are going around and by the commercials that you see about these is that you you can realize that many of these cases fail where the family confronts the person because the person themselves is unwilling to admit that they have a problem. And they just will not do it. They just will not admit it. And the reality of the situation is that's the first step. You have to admit, you have to acknowledge, you have to reckon this to be true about yourself before you can walk in a change in your life. Without that, it's never going to happen. You know, you have to look in the mirror and you have to admit it's me. The problem is here in my heart. And only then can the ensuing change begin. But that comes with you. You must reckon the truth about yourself to be true before you can ever change the course of your life. You must acknowledge it to be true before you can change the course of your life. So, with that in mind, I want to share a biblical illustration of that. Turn to Luke chapter 15. And it's, this illustration is found in the story of the prodigal son. And it, it's a classic demonstration for the, the truth that I'm trying to present today is found in this story. Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, forgive me. I'm sorry. Father, I'm sorry. Don't forget, I'm half in the dark here. <laughs> <laughs> and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them, his two sons, his living. And not many days after, the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with Riotous living. I, I can relate to this verse 
because when you are in a far country, does, you know, obviously he went far away. But anywhere you are in the world right now, if you're not saved, you're in a far country, you're away from God. And the world has a way of exacting things from you and taking things from you unmercifully. Like this young man. It says he went into a far country and there wasted, he wasted his substance. And, you know, you may have heard me say this before, but I picture him with his camels laden with all his worldly goods, some expensive. His father was no, you know, his father seemed to be a wealthy man. And as he pulls into town somewhere with his camels, you can see these two guys looking at him go, hey, Guido, look at this. There's our mark. Hey, kid, come here. <laughs> Familiar with these? There are 52 of them. Hey, you familiar with these? Let's play craps. Hey, kid, you shoot pool? And he wasted his substance with riotous living. Notice verse 14, and when he had spent all, all, there was nothing left. Boy, I'll tell you, that was me. That was me. I made a lot of money before I was saved. And I spent it all. I wasted every single on drugs and alcohol every day of my life. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he, that citizen, sent him into, uh, to feed into his fields to feed swine. That is the most graphic picture of how low a human being can sink in the word of God. A Jewish boy feeding pigs. That they're not even allowed to go near. That is low. Verse 16, And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. The world is a cruel place. And when he came, notice verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. The magic, the, the essence the heartbeat of what is happening here is found in verse 17. When he came to himself, he came to the realization. His eyes were opened, and he looked around and he said, oh, my goodness, and he's in the mud of a pig pen. And he came to himself. And he reckoned it to himself. He realized it. He acknowledged it to himself that this was true about him. You see where I'm going? You see where I'm going? Boy, you have to get this. This is what Paul is trying to make the body of Christ see and do. He's trying to make them come to themselves and reckon it, realize it, acknowledge it, receive it, impute it unto yourself. What happened to this boy after he did that? 
Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father. And will say unto him, Father, he's going to admit it. He's going to acknowledge his guilt. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Wow. All sin. Well, Romans 3, 19, 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. It's before God and in his sight that all things in this world happen. I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. In verse 12, he said, Father, give me. But when he came to himself, he said, Father, make me. That's the attitude that we come to God with. In our lives, we said, give me, give me, give me, give me, ever me wanteth, want more, more, give me more. But when we're saved, Father, make me. But that making me can only happen after you come to yourself and you reckon the truth about yourself to be true. The, the positive part of this story could not have happened unless he reckoned the truth of who he was to be true of himself. It could not have happened apart from that. And what we're going to continue to read in Romans chapter 6 cannot happen in your life until you reckon and acknowledge and understand this truth about what is true of Jesus Christ is also true of you. That's the order. That is the order of it. And just for the sake of the story, because this, this is one of the greatest stories in the Bible. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. The attitude of sorrow I know I had it when I got saved for my life. I think some people hear the gospel, oh, okay, I'll accept Jesus. Why? Why? Why bother? You obviously didn't need it. I'm not that bad of a person, but okay, I'll accept Jesus. That is not the attitude God was looking for in your heart when you came to Christ. It's said there that in verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. You know what that means? That means I think that in the morning, his father would get up and he'd say, oh, I wonder where my son is. And he'd walk out of his house and he'd walk over by the barn and he'd look out at that, that vast plain that he lived in and he'd look out, where's my son? Where's my son? And then the Bible says that when he decided to come home, that his father saw him yet a great way off. You know what that means? His father was looking for him, waiting, anticipating him to come home. And when he saw him, when the father saw him, 
He didn't recognize the clothes because that was all torn and tattered. He didn't recognize the, the, the sandals. They were tied on with bailing wire. That's not how he left home. He didn't recognize the hair because now he had a beard that was matted and turned and dirty. And his long robe dragging the ground. And he's coming home ashamed. He wasted everything. And he's walking. And he knows he's not worthy. <laughs> he's not even worthy to be called his son. And he knows it. And the father goes out. And runs to him. And hugs him. And kisses him. He says, Father, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be called your son. And the father looks at the, looks at the servant and says, get the calf. Get a ring. Get a ring. And they bring the ring. And they says, Father, I'm not worthy. Put it on, son. You're my son. Get some shoes. Get some shoes for his feet. Father, I'm not worthy to put, put them on. You're my son. Get a robe, the robe of righteousness. Father, I'm not worthy to put on that robe. Put it on, son. You're my son. And he was reunited to his father, to newness of life again. Why? Because one day he had come to himself and he had realized where he was. And Paul is telling us, reckon ye also yourselves. Not this, that's what you were. But reckon ye yourselves now what Christ has done for you. He's telling you in Romans 6, 11, get a hold of yourself. Get yourself together. Shake yourself up. Acknowledge this. Impute this truth to yourselves. Reckon it to be true that what is true of Jesus Christ is true of you. You are no longer that person. You're here. Although you may not realize it yet, you are here because that's what God says. And you reckon it. I died with Christ. I am buried with Christ. I live with Christ. And what is true of him is now true of me. And Paul is going to tell you, is going to explain to you, after verse 11, how to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye have been called. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. What will reckoning yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin do for you? What will receiving this truth, acknowledging this truth to yourselves lead to? Well, it will instill a confidence in you that will fortify and strength your, strengthen your inner man and it will lead you to say, it will lead you to say, and I submit that the verse that I'm going to show you, okay, the reason for Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8 are ultimately so that you will be able to say this, for I am persuaded, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the point and the purpose and the goal that in Romans 5, 6, 7 and chapter 8 is leading to. He's giving you all this information in these chapters so that one day you can say, for I am persuaded.
Amen. He wants you to get to the place where you will be persuaded in your mind and in your entire being. He wants you to be in the place in your Christian life where you will have confidence and assurance in knowing what Jesus Christ has done for you and the reason he wants you to get to this place in your heart and your, in your understanding is so that when death comes knocking, and it will, for sure it will, you will not say something like, I'm scared. You will not say that. You don't have any reason to be scared when you understand that. If that is you, if that is you watching, you have not reckoned. You have not appropriated this truth. You have not understood the truth of Romans chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 of what Jesus Christ has done for you and that what is true of him is also true of you. You don't understand it. Because you're not there yet, death is something that could scare you. It could scare you. But it should not. And I will tell you why. When you have reckoned this, when you have appropriated it, when you have imputed it to your account yourself in your own understanding, when you have received the truth of Romans chapter 6, the first 10 verses, you will understand this verse. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You will understand that verse. Paul goes on to say in verse 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, and to be with Christ, which is far better. <laughs> One thing you can be certain of the Apostle Paul is that he knew that what was true of Jesus Christ was true of himself. I can tell you one thing. I know that what was true of Jesus Christ is true of me. He knows. He knows this so well that the, the, the thought of staying on earth for him is creating a conflict with what he really wants to do. He says, I'm in a strait betwixt two. We say I'm between a rock and a hard place. You know? Having a desire to depart. You know what he's saying? He has a desire to die. That's his desire. He wants to go. He wants to be with Christ. Why? Which is far better. He goes on. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The reason he'll stay, <laughs> it was necessary for the people he was with. See, when you understand the truth of Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 10, and then you obey verse 11, and you allow the truth of who you are in Christ and what Christ has done for you to work in you effectually, you'll be able to say with the apostle, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But that will only happen the reality of that being true in your life will only happen when you have done this. Likewise, reckon. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This week, 
we looked at one word in that verse, really, reckon. Reckon ye. Next week, we'll finish the verse. Okay? This is something you have to apply to yourself, your heart. You know, you have to admit it. Just like an alcoholic has to admit he's an alcoholic. A person who is in Christ, who's been buried with Christ, raised with Christ, seated with Christ, has to admit it too. He has to acknowledge that in order to walk in the fullness of that. You understand? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we could spend in the Word of God. Thank you for the Scripture, which helps us to not only understand, but grow. For it's the word of God that worketh effectually in them that believe. I pray, Lord, that the truths of this message, especially this message, will forge themselves upon the tablets of our hearts and that we will walk away wanting to acknowledge living in the, in the reality of what is true of Jesus Christ is also true of me. And I pray that we will reckon this truth so that we can walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we have been called. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.